Mm, it's an honor for me to be one of my moderator in this conference of environmentalism in the world Muslim world. Okay, um, now um, it's a chance for me to uh, lead uh, one of the topic that will be delivered by Professor Eko Priyo Purnomo before uh, we start the discussion today. Please uh, welcome Professor Eko Priyo Purnomo. It's very energetic, yeah? <laughs> energetic. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Uh, let me tell a little bit uh, biography of Professor Eko Priyo Purnomo, PhD. He is um, now the, his position is an executive director of cooperation and international affairs. Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta Indonesia and then as a member of Majelis Lingkungan Hidup and HAM Pimpinan Pusat Muhammadiyah start from 2015 and 2020 her bachelor degree is in Ilmu Pemerintahan Universitas Gajah Mada and his master in Ilmu Politik Universitas Gajah Mada and his doctor from Political Sciences University of Bradford is it correct? No? yes well uh, before we start the discussion today uh, let me share you a bit um, about the issues um, that Today we will uh, discuss uh, with Professor Eko. Well, in Islamic studies, as we know that environmental issues are an interesting topic. Not only in academic discourse, environmental issues are also included in the study of Islamic law, or what we know as fiqih. In Islamic legal discourse, it is known as fiqhul bi'ah. In fiqih, we know that previous Islamic scholars or mutakodimin, if uh, sorry if uh, it's incorrect in mentioned the name, have begun to comprehensively discuss environmental issues. And then, furthermore, uh, the discussion of environmental discourse in fiqih also didn't go unnoticed by uh, contemporary Islamic scholars uh, or mutakhirin. Islam as a religion has an important role in continuing to talk about environmental issues. It doesn't stop as part of legal discourse, but also need to be translated into practice. Because in principle, legal product must be able to be implemented in a tangible form in society. Well, the practical level of this environmental issue has so, sorry, has so, sociological implications. After all, uh, we know that humans are parties who are always in connect with nature as uh, we uh, already um, was it discussed before with our invited speakers and now here we will again discuss the discourse of environmental issues in islam of course our discussion today is a part of continuing the developing of discourse that have been started since the mutakodimin Okay, as I heard before, Prof. Eko said that um, nowadays is a modern 
uh, Islam. So that's why why we need to discuss further about these issues, about uh, environmental issues. Uh, let's discuss further with Professor Eko. Okay, uh, please, uh, Prof, um, give us the, what is it uh, insight um, uh, issues about the discussion today. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Robi Soli Sodri, Wasi Amli, Wali Tutan Milisani, Ya Khalil Khalil. Uh, thank you very much for the moderator, Ms. A.V. Uh, I do think, I think I need to take off my mask because it's fit for me to breathe with a mask. <clears throat> And I know that my face is not handsome enough like Batman or Superman, <laughs> but <laughs> compared to our lady, Miss uh, Effie. But thank you very much to everyone. Um, previously, Miss Effie already explained about uh, my position. Currently, my position is just uh, ordinary people at UMY. I just uh, staff at UMY. And currently, I haven't managed anything except a uh, lecturer and in graduate school management. <coughs> and currently, I also joined in Majlis Lingwan Itu PP Muadiyah, or we call it a uh, Muhammadiyah Environmental Council in Central Board of Muhammadiyah. That's the current position when you talk about what is your position in Muhammadiyah. But if you talk about me, what is your contribution part of Muhammadiyah and what is your contribution part of humans in environments, I think I do nothing. Because frankly to say, today we are talking about Islam and we are talking about climate change, we are talking about environments, but we stay in very nice room with very cool air condition, of oh, goodness. That's why some, uh, when the first time I came here, when I came in these rooms, I just sit for a while and then I get out because why this room is too cool for me. Even I already wear my suit, but I don't know, maybe Miss Ify is fine, but for me it's too cool for me. But that's okay. So today actually I would like to give some brief, uh, maybe just five or ten minutes discussion about one of my part of my books. I just published a book published by Road Lex. It, it just passed please last month in February. So I I written about renewable energy. So the reason why I'm concerned about renewable energy, particularly why we have to look at about renewable energy in Indonesia and also in big picture renewable energy in Asian Pacific context. Okay, next uh, is uh, when we talk about this background, I think my background already mentioned before, in some of experience, I already done several visiting professor in America, I've been visit Michigan University, University of Maryland College Parks, and then in Asia, I've been in Korea University, and then Tamasat, Konkens, and in Malaysia University, and then UUM, and currently I'm still visiting professor in Konkan University. Kalasin and Universitas Utara Malaysia. And in terms of professorship, I just got the professorship last year because I have a very good teamwork. So I really encourage you, if you want to be good a lecturer and to become a full professor here, please make sure you have a good teamwork. Because if you ever seen or if you ever watch a movie, but if you have you ever watched a movie that we call it The Avengers, yeah, in The Avenger movie, If you ever seen the Avenger movie, even hero cannot stand alone. Yeah, me too as well. I'm not hero, I'm just ordinary people, so I need many heroes to support me, especially my wife. <laughs> Next about the outline. When we're talking about the outline, our discussion, we will discuss about firms. We're talking about the introductions and then why renewable energy is important and then what is the literature review, what is the review about the... Uh, it, And then upon the trends, and then the renewable energy, what should we do when we're talking about renewable energy, and then question and answer. And hopefully, uh, in the last section, we will talk much about 
not maybe a question, but maybe about the comment from the audience, either the audience in here and also through online. Next one. When we're talking about the renewable energy, actually, we have to think several things. The first one, when we're talking about the renewable energy, renewable is something that Actually, when we're talking energy in the world, if some people believe that energy is always existing, the energy is uh, can be changed, can be transformed. But as Muslim believe, we are believe that everything in the universe is limited. Everything in the world in is limited only god and allah is unlimited so this is the first one we'll be talking about the energy that this is considered that the material that we need to be considered the second one when we're talking about the as the world facing of the embeddings the energy so we have problem in the world currently when we're talking about energy there is a lack of energies so in current situation when we're talking about energy we not only lack of the energy but we have a problem the distribution of energy. Maybe the energy in the world, in the universe is lots, but we're talking about how to make sure that the energy is distributed equally. The next issue when we're talking about the energy is on, also we have to uh, talk about the stock and also how we can make sure that the stock is enough or not. But I do believe in my religion when the earth thing the energy is not enough so maybe the earth will healing they will do they can do some healing for example in the current situation when we're talking about energy so we have a good very good example what do you think about COVID? is it COVID is good thing or is bad thing so i ask you what do you think about COVID? is it good thing or bad thing <laughs> for some people maybe equal but for people i think many of the people think it's a bad thing because many of you maybe you already lost your relative maybe some of you already lost your friends some of you maybe lost your jobs some of you maybe lost everything but maybe some of you already got as well with the COVID. but from the earth from the universe actually COVID is good one why? When we're talking about the energy, actually when we're talking about the COVID, COVID is good one. Maybe when we want to minimize COVID to us, we need a vaccine. But for the earth, COVID is the real vaccine for the earth. Why? Because in some point, humans, are, or I think human is the most dangerous species in the earth. So the earth thinks that COVID is a vaccine for the earth so the vaccine will kill the strains will kill the virus that we call human so this another things when we're talking about the energy as well so we have to think about that one so in my opinion i think if we're talking about environments COVID is good thing because why there are many people stop for the job there are many people stop to travel around there are many flights already grounded there are so many cars still in gates, so it means the earth is become greener. It's true. So you can see it. If you see the world matter, if you see the UNCP, the temperature in the earth is going down during the COVID-19. But no, I think will be going up again. And by, because by AP will travel around, <laughs> or maybe by AP will go to shopping mall and again. And the next one, when we're talking next, Mas Akil, when we're talking about the data, this is the data about the energy consumption. If you see in the lines, when we're talking about the energy consumption, the most highest consumption is people who live in Asia and Pacific. This is the, the blue ones, is the highest is line coming from Asia. So it's, I don't know, maybe because most of people in the world live in ASEAN regions and the next one the second one is people who live in uh, North America and the third one the people who live in Europe and the last at the least I think they who live in the Middle East area 
So when we talking about the consumption of energy, we can see maybe because we in Asia we have India, we have China, we have Indonesia. So we talking about the population, we are the most populous country. The second one, there are so many industry located in this area. China, India, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia is the most place manufacturing located in there. Maybe less factory located in Europe or North America, but most of factory located in this place. So you can imagine why in this area consume a lot of energy. But that's good in other things, so it means we can make big hole from ocean in this area as well. <laughs> and the next one, next when we're talking about the data about the total energy consumption, non-renewable energy, we can see this is from when we're talking about in which particular sector, why energy, especially the non-renewable energy is very high. The first one, because of industry. So we can see again that most of people use the energy for industry. The second one from transportation. So as I mentioned before, when we're talking about COVID, actually it's good one, the COVID happened. Because there are so many industry closed down, so it means the consumption of energy is going down. So when we're talking about COVID, there are so many people not travel alone, they just do everything at home, that we call it WFA. Some people say work from home, but maybe some people say time for layah-layah. Yeah, generasi rebahan, itu repotnya. Makanya anak saya madanya makin besar. Maybe some of you are also can see, maybe you can compare before and after. You can take a picture 2019 and 2022. So you can imagine, you can compare the picture, which one you are uh, not say fatter, but maybe which one you are more makmur. <laughs> so there is the, uh, the second non-renewable consumption is coming from uh, transportation. The next one is coming from uh, non-energy use. Uh, coming from energy use is mean not uh, because maybe they are consumption non-energy use, which mean maybe they do for eating, they do for planting. We use energy as well. If you go to Paddy Field, you use a tractor, so it means they use energy as well. You need a petrol for your tractor machine, so something like that. That's we call it non-energy use. And the next one, uh, the data that I want to show here is about the data about uh, which particular area in Asia that in terms of energy, I mean the resources of energy, most of the, I mean the most strongest country when we're talking about energy, the first one is China, the second one is India, but the most I mean, in here, the less country is here is we call it is Iraq and also Uni Emirat Arab when we're talking about the amounts of energy. And next one, when we're talking why renewable energy is a good matter, as I mentioned before, because we have already explained about the background in the slide two and the slide three about energy, the energy is limited that we think we have to think about something that renewable. So why we have to think about renewable? Because renewables is we can use anytime and we can try to make sure the earth still warm, not to be hot. We can make sure that the earth still to be left and lovable or because we cannot move anywhere, frankly to say. Many people maybe want to make some colony in the moons, maybe some people want to make colony in Mars, but it's just the dreams. So I'm sure in the next 20 years, it cannot be true. So we have to think for in the next 20 years, still to think about renewable energy. The next one, uh, I already analyzed several data. In here, actually, I already analyzed about the trend in renewable energy in research. I already analyzed maybe around 
2000 papers in Scopus. When we talking about paper in Scopus, we can see that long time ago, maybe coming from 2010s, when we talking about 2010, many paper is less talk about renewable energy in 2010. But currently, the renewable energy is become a trend in Scopus. I, we already analyzed this one. But we have to be curious in which particular country focus on this research. When we look at this issue, so most of the paper, the most uh, country who look at and who focus on the research is coming from United States. So you can imagine, ladies and gentlemen, the trend in research about renewable energy is significantly improved, but most of the author, most of the institution is coming from uh, America. And then the second one, surprisingly, if many people complain about China, because there are so many industry in there, so we have to thank as well, many research coming from China scholars. This is data that we already have. The second one, many papers who are already indexing in Scopus is coming from India. So if some Western people, if some other scholar criticize that China, United States, India is the most country who make a waste and use energy in the world earth, yes, it's true. But in other side, those country as well support research about renewable energy. So it's really interesting. But in here, I couldn't see Indonesia. So it's not the proof, but Miss Effie and also all everyone here, we have to think and we have to do this kind of research. That there is very, very few people in Indonesia look at about renewable energy. The next one, when we're talking about the renewable energy in the research, I think I will move and jump about the trend in renewable energy research. The first one, we have, when we talk about the best hour review of the literature review, it's also portable that whole research on renewable energy has been one more diverse. So this is another issue as well as I mentioned before. We have to do two things why the trend is significant, but why we still have problem lack of energy. The next issue, we have to think why when we're talking about renewable energy, there are only 10 countries focus on this particular issue. What happened with another country? What happened with another people, a scholar who live in other region? The next one, the next issue that when, when we look at it here is about where, why renewable energy, we're talking about the diverse of resources of renewable energy. What kind of resources, what kind of source of renewable energy that we can look at. And the next one, when we talk about the renewable energy as well, next, this is the picture. Uh, maybe on Saturday, Miss Ify, I already talked with Mas Milana and Pak Rector, maybe we can learn about the, this is a tool that we call it post viewer, Miss Milana on all the audience. So for those who want to join, we can come here. We, I will give some a brief a few about these methods. When we're talking about the renewable energy, there are some uh, issues as well, based on the our research here, our trend here. When we're talking about the energy, renewable energy, we have a problem, many problems here, about the energy, about the transit, about the energy of uh, from Samson and something like and the policy, what kind of the policy that we have to support, what if the lack of the policy, so what should the individual can be done, what should the, there is another issue as well in the picture is about the institution in governments and what is the institution in uh, social and NGO sector, something like that. This is another issue. I will explain during the key and answer letter and then the trends. Uh, when we're talking about the trend as well, Mas Akil, I think we will move to the trend in renewable energy. 
about the, for example, about the discuss how the policy. So I think this is the the discussion that we can pay attention about when we're talking about renewable energy. What is the policy that do you think should be done by the government? The next question, when we're talking about the policy, for example, do you think Indonesia should support renewable energy, particularly in biofuels? Because currently, there is another issue. When we're talking about petrol, when we're talking about the gas, so many cars now become jump to be electric city. They can become to electric cars. Actually, Indonesia have renewable energy that we coming from biofuels. So this is another issue. Why many people buy battery? Why many people buy electric car? Why many people buy electric bicycle? Actually, we have biofuel. What happened with our biofuel? Why we not support automotive industry who use biofuel? Because we have a lot of biofuel, but we just follow European or Americans or not American countries because they lack of biofuel. Do you know why Tesla is getting bigger and bigger? Do you know why the owner of Tesla, what is the owner of Tesla? Uh, my uncle, Elon Musk. Why all of us are getting richer? Because many people just follow and just pay attention with battery. But do you know what happened with the battery? What happened if the battery is black and then they die for five or ten years? There is waste. But we already have a biofuel. This is the first issue about the policy. The next one, when they put the policy, how about the culture of our because many of us, you still happy to use the uh, aircon, you consume many electricity at the same time. Maybe you just travel around with your car or motorbikes. Maybe you just go to next uh, shops. But you not be aware, just on foot, walk. But why? So you can imagine, oh, why when you go to apps, maybe just second floor, you prefer use a... Uh, elevator or a lift in my personal life even in umy or anywhere if the building is less than five level i always try to use start this is about the culture is uh, is about your habit the society habit maybe some people say because we are rich people so we are it's good modern building so we have to be Embedded with elevator, lift, and something like that. But you have, you can imagine in some developed country, those people who use elevator or lift is only for disabled people or elderly. But in here, no. Even you are still young, you are strong, but you say, ah, better I use lift. The next one, when we're talking about the trend, I think. We have to think about what we can do as a researcher, what we can do we as a lecturers. What can we teach to our students when we're talking about renewable energy? Should we teach them about renewable energy or not? Or when we're talking about renewable in our class, for example, how much and how many you already talk to your renewable energy? For example, in here, sometimes I'm... When we're talking about climate, we're talking about environments, but most of in front of us, there is still a bottle of water. In my university, we try to dispose of this thing. We provide kind of uh, dispenser, and every student should bring their own cup. Uh, but in here, maybe because you are rich, jadi mungkin lebih murah beli botolan gini kali ya. Okay, so I really encourage uh, UMT and all of you around the clubs, if you really think about renewable or if you think about environment, please try to implement not only for you, but only on your own community, how you live in environmental way, how you live in sustainable way, especially for your daily life. Maybe that's all for me, so I will be happy.
to discuss. I will be happy to accept your comment because I am here to learn lots. Because if you're talking about the PowerPoint, about the paper, I will send my paper to you and I will send my PowerPoint to you. Thank you very much. Ayo kalam. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So well, thank you, Prof, uh, for your really interesting topic yeah, to be discussed. Um, yeah, uh, as I make a conclusion here uh, from what uh, Prof Echo uh, mentioned mentions before related to the um, energy, yeah, uh, renewable energy matters. Uh, he said that it's uh, movable. And then we can use every time, so it means um, uh, usable, yeah. Uh, or we can uh, renew, yeah, uh, something that we can um, uh, have. Uh, what is it? Uh, perhaps re recycle or uh, move to. Um, what is it like? Uh, he said before. Uh, why don't we try to use? Um, something to be uh, more um, useful, yeah, for the energy cons consumption, yeah. For example, here for uh, Asia, uh, it is the total energy consumption is be belong to or uh, we the winner is Asia, yeah. Uh, and then the energy consumption uh, for using industry, transportation, and residential. Well. Um, yeah, uh, we invited uh, for the participants who will give comments or any questions related to these issues. Perhaps you, uh, uh, here the participants want to have a discussion related to the policy, as uh, Prof. Echo said before, or about biofuel. Yeah, or have any comment related to actually what policy that probably taken from the government uh, related to the renewable energy matters so we can uh, save our environment. Okay, or uh, hear from uh, Islamic, uh, what is it, matters, yeah. Okay, Pa Suparto, yeah. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Pak Eko, Prof. Eko, uh, I'm very interesting with your your paper. Especially, I have an idea that UMP become the first the first uh, campus that implement. Uh, the the green energy. I mean, uh, we we know that every month we paid twenty seven million for the electricity because using the leaf we have to leave, and the leaf is not effective actually. And I thought I discussed with my friend. If we can change the leaf with with other energy, because we can uh, we can save twenty seven million per month. So twenty seven million times twelve, it it means two point seven million billion. Uh, so if we buy, we use the the wind energy, the wind, yeah. uh, we can make, uh, we can make, uh, we have the technical <coughs> engineering yeah. uh, department mm. and we can give to the student for their Final, final project, 
for one or two students to make uh, one energy uh, because it is very cheap. I I said two students can create uh, one energy. Uh, energy it is just the album LPG. Yeah. Uh, so convert with this. That is very, very, very simple actually, and the cost is not much, and uh, the student can create it. And then <coughs> we will free for the electricity, and we are the first, uh, the first campus in Muhammadiyah that implement the green energy. So we have discussion and when we will propose to the director when it's ready. Uh, we still in discussion about that because uh, that prospect is very good and real and doable. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Pak Suparto, for uh, the comment. Yeah, uh, Pak Suparto uh, have uh, really expect uh, UMT uh, as a pioneer. Yeah, who what is it? Um, produce energy. Yeah, from what is it? The the, the changes of elevator. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your um, comments, Prof? Miss Effie, really, are you Sundanese? Are you coming from Sunda? Oh, because your accent is UMT. Okay, now on UMT. <laughs> UMT. Okay. Um, on my first slide, we're talking about the diverse city of resources. So I do agree, Pak uh, Parto, when we're talking about the diversity of resources of energy. Yeah, we still need electricity coming from the government. We need still electricity landa. We still need um, water for PDRM. But on the other hand, I think we have to think what we can do to make sure that this building, this university, work on sustainable way. Maybe we have to think about other resources. For example, maybe we can install uh, power uh, coming from uh, maybe sun or maybe we want to solar panel we want can we can install here because if the you think the winds is very high here so we can try to create a power wheel or something like that I think it's good thing as well because I have been to Utrecht in Utrecht University there is a call a green building sometimes maybe if you have been to Utrecht in Utrecht University, there is a green building. All those things, uh, they, all the energy coming from the own building. They already installed the solar panels. If when we're talking about the water, they only got the water from just from the raining. So you can imagine. So when people want to make a drink, so they just waiting for the rain. After they put all the big time. After that, they make some I don't know mechanism or something like that. All the drink is drinkable. After that, if you go to toilet, sorry to say, they just do, I mean, recycling. They make some another treatment. So make sure that the waste will become the fertilized for the plant in this building. But for the good already clean water, you can drink again. But you can imagine you never think that the thing that you already drink is not coming, not only coming from the rains, but it's also coming from your own. But nobody knows. But this is really green building. When we're talking about energy as well, all the electricity is coming from those. I mean, the solar panel also winds. And uh, interestingly, uh, every corner, they all, always provide a stir. And only small uh, elevator provide, and is only the 
uh, mention is on special needs people only that one but if you want use it that's okay so it's mean you are special people maybe you have VIP because you are minister or something like that but in my opinion special people is really special uh, this I think this way that we I think we have to trail and that one to pull and oh I also visit uh, another green building in my university in Leeds and also my university in Bradford. There is a green building as well, but the green building in Bradford only use their own energy only 60%, not 100%. But in Utrecht is more than 90%. So it depends on you. I think you have to think about the diverse of resources, not only coming from the government, but maybe coming from your own. Maybe in the first time, it's big investment. But for long terms, it will be good saving. So it depends on you. Depend on the, our policy. Depend on our record. Depend on our government. You want to invest big investment in the short time, but you will get benefit for the long terms. Not only in terms of the money, but in terms of the environment. That's my also question. Which one do you choose? The short time or long time benefit? If for me, I think I will choose long time benefit even in the first time is a very high investment thank you okay it's really great answer prof so uh, here we did to what is it choose um, first yeah what we want to uh, have for the long term or, or the short term and then uh, it's really helpful for us yeah to take advantage of natural resources yeah that's what I got from uh, Professor Echo just now. Okay. Uh, any uh, other comments? Yeah. To continue my discussion, I think this is a serious discussion because it is need implemented. I have calculated about the cost and benefit. And this is only one year of the UMT didn't pay the, uh, the electricity bill. And that as the investment of the UMT, 2.7 million in one year. And after that, free. Uh, actually, this is actually, uh, yeah, doable. But because I'm graduate from Australia, I, in my campus, there is a building that everything, the electricity, they make by themselves. They create themselves everything by panel, uh, surya and wind, wind molen. And that is, it is work. Why we not copy that technology? Because the technology is simple actually. This, because if we can uh, copy, imitate that, and making for ourselves, I think that that is not so complicated. And uh, and yeah, because this is about the mentality. For example, a student didn't want to bring their own tablet. They prefer to have like this, but this is not environmental friendly. Is it like, like clean in the surface, but uh, creating another problem after that? Because we, we are not uh, have the culture to recycle, 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 because we need to recycle the resource actually limited. That's why we re recycle, reuse it. Okay, that's all my, my talk, not really not my talk. But that is ordinary people thought also. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you, uh, Pak Parto, uh, for 
any what is it uh, further insight yeah to be um, discussed for future uh, University of Muhammadiyah okay. Tangerang okay um, actually is there another question oh yeah uh, Pak Hairo uh, could you please anyone help me to what is it Yes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name Hayrul Saleh from Eko and Miss Ihpi. I'm not from English department, but from mathematics department. So my English is not good. I think it is not my problem. It is your problem to understand it. Uh, I want to say about water I think water is uh, bagian dari environment ya yeah, dari lingkungan and in Islam every Muslim use water to wudu ya yeah, for for salat and uh, I have seen Ustaz Adi Hidayat can wudu with only one cup of water And uh, we see in the most Muslim in the mosque or in in their home, yeah, use a lot of water for wudu, not enough uh, with one a cup of water. And I think it is a very important thing for us, for Muslim, how to improve the environmentals. Uh, about water and it's uh, about uh, re have a relation with education uh, uh, say with Mr. Suprapto about it in UMT and in another school how we teach the student the student to use water effectively efficiently and It is Islamic about Mubazir. Yeah. Wash of water, uh, use a lot of water from only one wudu. But, uh, padahal, although, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, of course, we can use only one cup of water. As I seen from Ustaz Adi Hidayat. Uh, I want to know about your opinion about it. Thank you, Mr. Teko. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Hairul. Yeah, uh, it's talking about water, yeah. Previously, uh, actually, Miss um, Haryani already explained yeah, about water, but then, um, yeah, we have another questions for from Pak Hairul, related to water. Uh, what do you think, Prof? For the question. Thank you very much. In my opinion, I think there is no waste in the earth. Why there is waste? Because there is something that we can't, we don't use it. That's we call it waste. In my opinion, there is no waste. Water, after you use for your wudu, there are so many water there. But I think it's no waste. When you put there in a big tongue and then you put a fish there so there is no waste actually or for example if you eat and then finish your food but there is something that you don't need it but if you give it to the chicken there is no waste see actually in my opinion there is no waste the waste is happened because you don't know how to use it this is my first comment the second one that's true when we're talking about uh, water A years ago, I went to South Africa. I went to uh, makamnya uh, Al Makassari. There is a uh, rebellion. The Dutch call rebellion, but we call it hero. Yeah. Jadi ada imam. There is a big imams coming from uh, Makassar. 
non Rasul Hasan Sen tapi di kolet Hz kolet Syekh Yusuf nah Syekh Yusuf Al Makassari uh, Syekh Yusuf and uh, because they are because of the rebellions uh, the Dutch sent Syekh Yusuf to South Africa and South Africa in South Africa so that's why there are so many Muslim people live in South Africa and then spread out to Africa actually the Imam that call it Syekh Yusuf Al Makassari when I went there in there is there is a mosque in Syekh Ma in, near the Maham of Syekh Al Makassari there the water if you want to take a wudu there it's not like here the water is with the big blow <laughs> not like that one in that place it's only like whispering jadi cuma kayak uap itu loh it's just like whispering so there is no worse even there is no single water drop from the top so you can imagine i don't know what kind of technology on that one because why because in africa water is very expensive so expensive limited so i don't know what kind of technology i think it's very simple the water is just like whispering something like that but i but we feel that we already take a proper wudu jadi anda bisa bayangkan loh hanya cuma kayak zzz gitu tapi kita sudah merasa wudu gitu dan tidak ada, there is no single drop tidak ada yang jatuh satu pun atas pun tidak ada jadi if you think about west if you think about we do some mubazir we do some uh, something that west full i think is no i think we can do like that one as well and i do believe mas is and also i support with pak parto is about our cultures about our mental if that's why for me in my case based on the side after i visit this area i promise in myself when i take a wudu i just try to put open very small my tap water it's very small tapi kalian kan sukanya bikin yang besar so there is a plenty of water there on the floor but i try after that i just open a small things and then try to make sure there is no something that cannot drop too much i think we have to think about that or If you try, I think you can do as well in UMD. Maybe you can do uh, the the water. You can make in the big tank and then you just put in. Uh, maybe you can put the water from your wudu to put on your, I mean, uh, trees or something like that. Or if you want, you can make it to be uh, like a small lake, something like that. I think this is the way that we can do. In Majlis Lingkungan Hidup Muhammadiyah (MLH) or Muhammadiyah Environmental Council, we already established uh, green building. There is indicator of green building, Miss AV. We already have indicator of green buildings. I think UMT can take this certificate if you meet with this all those thing requirement. So Majlis Lingkungan Hidup will give green building or not. So actually, we already established kind of accreditation for green building. But I think in here, I think it's far from green building. In my opinion, in my opinion. But maybe after this we can change. After this maybe you can open all those things. So maybe try to put the air condition in in only smooth, not high like that one processing sample. I think, thank you very much, Mas Kairil. But because your name, I don't know, Kairil or Hairil? Hairil, Hairil. Because uh, Hairil Anwar is, my, my, is only good in Bahasa. That's true, Mas. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mas Hero, thank you Mas Hero. Okay, thank you Prof. And then um, it's been answered by Professor Eko, yeah, related to the usage of water, yeah, uh, as uh, Pak Hero mentioned before, Mubazir, yeah. Uh, I conclude that it depends on the culture, yeah. And then, um, yeah, hopefully after this, uh, anyone here who Uh, what is it? Uh, listened to the discussion today. Uh, what is it? Uh, start from now using uh, what is water for wudu, not uh, what is it for mubazir, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Um, here actually we have another um, keynote speaker, invited speaker, uh, Prof. Professor Franz. 
Yeah, but uh, Dan, uh, he's not here. Um, he's in Zoom. And then for the presentation, uh, will be, uh, what is it, played? Um, the recording here. So we can uh, hear uh, the presentation from Prof. Professor Franz, but then before we uh, are listening for the presentation, let me um, let me yeah say hey, Prof, are you here now? Yes, I'm here. Okay, yeah, yeah. From um, from France. Uh, wait a minute. I'd, I'd like to um, read a little bit about Prof. France. Yeah, about the biography of uh, Prof. France. Okay. Um, he is uh, from um, Netherlands, Netherlands. And then the academic education, he is a PhD, of, a PhD theology, um, and then MA theology, and then BA uh, theology. And then her uh, history, his further studies is uh, cultural anthropology, and then advanced uh, Swahili, and his academic position um now is a director of the Netherlands School of Advanced Studies in Theology and Religion. Yeah, start from 2019 and today. Um, and his secondary function, he is a visiting professor in the Nation Consortium from, for Religious Studies and then honorary professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, and honorary professor in the Department of uh, Sociology and Anthropology. Okay, um, we can uh, listen to the recording now, or continue to the question and answer? Video first, yeah? Okay, yeah, please. Oh, no video. Okay. So, um, oh, directly present the materials. Okay. Please, uh, Prof. Franz, time's yours. Okay. Your voice, excuse me. Um, I didn't prepare my uh, lecture. I thought we, we would listen to the recording and then have the yeah. discussion. Okay. No, no preparing the, no discuss. Uh, okay, okay, no presentation. But then, um, but you have the recording. Okay, it's already recording now. Uh, for the question and answer session, perhaps for Mr. Fr Mr. Franz, is it? Yeah. If is it uh, available for uh, presenting the video? Is it possible? Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, okay. uh, it is a pleasure and an honor for me to present uh, some ideas about environmentalism in the Muslim world at this very important uh, conference. And I thank Director Dr. Ahmad Amarulun and the Chair of the Preparatory Committee, Mr. Yus Rizal Amasa, for the invitation to speak uh, today. My paper is called Eco theology in Indonesian Islam, stewardship between interaction and inclusion. And hopefully later on the subtitle will be clear to you. The paper is based on ongoing uh, field work, it is work in progress, and it is co authored by my PhD student. Mr. Afnan Anchori of UEM Semarang, and in no way we claim that uh, this paper is final. In August 2015, 
the Islamic Foundation for Ecology and Environment, Environmental Science, in collaboration with Islamic Relief Worldwide, released the Islamic Declaration on Global Climate Change. This was at the International Islamic Climate Change Symposium in Istanbul. There were also Indonesian participants there. It was the first declaration of its kind, but not the first expression of environmentalism in the Muslim world. Already in 1966, the Muslim philosopher Sayyad Hassan Nasser wrote about environmentalism. And this was one year earlier than the American historian Lynn White, who is often quoted in the religion and environment debate. And increasingly, we see Muslim activists all over the world promoting a green and a clean Islam. In this paper, I will focus on Indonesia. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not only, because, not only because uh, Indonesia has the largest Muslim population in the world, but also it is named the third largest polluter in the world. Rivers such as Silevum and Chitarum belong to the most polluted rivers in the world. They contain microplastics, chemicals, methods, and antibiotics. Indonesia lost already 80% of its rainforest, which causes climate change, because deforestation reduces the carbon absorbing power of trees. Indonesia is also the second highest emitter of greenhouse gas, and it is the second biggest contributor to plastic waste in the world, causing health problems and floods. What I see as challenges in Islamic thought is first a gap between the theory and practice in environmental ethics and secondly in relation to this a tension between a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach in Islamic theology. In this paper I advocate a bottom-up approach in developing eco-theology in Indonesian Islam. This is what I call empirical theology on ecology. In its preamble, the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change says, I quote, Our species, though selected to be caretaker or steward, caliphate on earth, has been the cause of such corruption and devastation on it that we are in danger ending life as we know it on our planet. End of quote. This is a rather pessimistic mood. I will come back to this later. The reference to the human being as caretaker and steward is widespread in writings by Muslim authors. However, it is ambiguous as it is interpreted in different and sometimes contradicting ways, not only in Islam, but also in Christianity that has the same concept. In our project on eco-theology in Indonesian Islam, we use a mixed method approach, combining quantitative and qualitative research, making use of questionnaires and interviews. In a small-scale pilot study, spreading a questionnaire among 100 respondents in Indonesia, exploring images of human and nature interaction, we used a topology based on literature. We, distinct, we distinguish, in general, four images of human-nature interaction. First, the humans as masters of nature, and humans exploit nature. Second, humans as stewards of nature or guardians as nature. Third, humans as partners of nature. And fourth, humans as participants in nature. So four different images 
of human nature interactions. And through our questionnaire, we tried to find out what image has most support in Indonesia. We found that most respondents supported a what we call nature-centric version of the stewardship model. There's not a steward that is master over nature or leader of nature, but the steward as a partner or participant in nature. I will come back to that later. We reported the findings of our pilot study uh, earlier. In this paper, we aim to acquire a deeper insight into the findings, making use of the qualitative research, conducting interviews among 20 Naplatu Ulama members and 20 Muhammadiyah members. In the questionnaire, the respondents were asked to grade statements on a four scale, uh, on a four point scale, ranging from fully agree to fully disagree. The analysis showed that statements such as God commands humans to wisely manage the Earth's resources for the sake of human betterment and being religious humans must protect the rights of nature showed the highest level of agreement. Exploitation-oriented statements such as the ability to think puts humans above nature, or at the other end of the spectrum, a participant-oriented state, statement such as God, humans, and nature are one, but relatively lower level of agreement. The term steward was not mentioned as such in the questionnaire, but it was used in the interviews. And that is what I'm going to deal with now. As one interviewee said, I quote, nature is God's creation, Allah. Because nature is God's creation, everything is nature, and everything has the same function, status and responsibility as creature, as nature. But in carrying out its function, each type of creature is different. But the point is the same. They are nature. The only one is Allah as creator. So that because the status and the function is different, but the relation must be the same. There must be appreciation and respect between one creature and another, especially because humans are created as stewards, as leaders as subjects for nature. It does not mean that humans treat nature as they want. No, but he must be full of responsibility according to his nature as creation. He must respect nature. He must preserve creation, even though it can be used, but it may not be damaged or eliminate the respect for nature. The general view is like this, end of quote. A rather long, uh, long quote from a respondent, but it, it shows already the dilemma. Uh, on the one hand, uh, human, humans and nature are equal, and they are creators of God. On the other hand, uh, humans have a special uh, position in creation. So th this shows a uh, kind of a dilemma. As creators of God, humans and nature are the same. That's uh, human beings have a special function as stewards, as leaders. And in fact, the informant combined uh, two models, namely humans and nature. That is what we call an interaction model. So we have two entities, humans and nature, and they interact. And a humans in nature. This is what we call the inclusion model. And so humans are part of nature. They are not separated from nature. But in practice, this creates a dilemma. A member of Muhammadiyah put it this way, and again I quote, we always use a Quranic verse in Al-Baqarah chapter, 
quote, it is he who created for you all of that which is on the earth. Then he directed himself to heaven, his being above all creation, and made them seven heavens. And he is knowing of all things. Everything that exists on earth is for humans. But it is limited by the rule, quote, and cause not corruption upon the earth after its reformation, end of quote. Do not damage. So please take advantage, but do not damage. Please use it, but do not damage it. Please construct, but do not deconstruct, end of quote. You see how the uh, respondent is um, dealing with the two positions of the human being in nature, and we may use it, but we may not damage it. And three times uh, he uses the same phrase, take advantage, but do not damage. Please use it, but do not damage. Please construct, but do not deconstruct. So it is a theory. Um, of using nature without damaging it. But in practice, it is not always easy to find the right balance. Again, I quote from a uh, respondent, quote, sometimes it is difficult for us to differentiate which one is constructive and which one is destructive. At the same time, we construct and deconstruct. Now, the toll road is being constructed. How many trees have been cut down? In fact, the toll roads construct or deconstruct? Constructing and deconstructing are only slightly different, even though our theological foundation is welcome. Growth and cause not corruption upon the earth after its reformation. Do not destruct it. That is the most basic thing we propagate, end of quote. Now, the reference to a toll road is a metaphor for progress, human progress. And human progress seems at odds with nature conservation. Mentioning cutting of trees for the sake of building a toll road, the informant said, I quote, therefore, anyone who cut down one tree should plant one tree so that it becomes the basis for maintaining the equilibrium of life and maintaining balance. I think there is a philosophy of cutting one tree and planting one tree. Do not forget, cut down one and plant one. We are busy cutting down, but we forget to plant. It is fun to cut the tree, but we forget to plant. I think this is it. This is why there is an imbalance, end of quote. So, here again you see the, the, the respondent uh, struggling between, on the one hand, the necessity of the toll road for human progress, and of course all of us want human progress. On the other hand, we are aware that building a toll road also damages nature. So there is a responsibility to restore. So looking for the right balance. Uh, and many, many interviewees uh, that we spoke, they mentioned moderation, moderation and balancing as keywords uh, when they talk about Islamic dealings with environmental issues. Now the informant explicitly appeals to the image of man as steward. A quote, I think an environmental slogan of one tree a million benefits is true, because with trees the air is beautiful, with the trees there is oxygen, with the trees there are birds, caterpillars can be there, butterflies can be there, everything is there because of trees. Allah is creator, God, but also manager. He creates as well as manages the nature. But it is impossible for Allah to come down into the world and then water the trees. So who waters the trees? 
we do. The function of our stewardship is to protect the trees, to protect rivers. This nature is for humans, but not to spoil it. So the stewardship value includes protecting environment. That is why that is why the real meaning of steward is extraordinary, because it is in all aspects of life. End of quote. So it is because God cannot come down to the earth to water the trees that humans must do it. So the steward is a vice to run. In uh, Christian terminology, it's more or less the same. Uh, we speak about imago dei. So the informant link cutting of trees for the sake of human progress with environmental degradation and floods. But the floods are not natural disasters. They are caused by humans because they go against the law of nature. Because nature is not an object that people can use at will, nature is a subject. I quote, in my opinion, nature was created by Allah perfectly and has a law of nature that necessitates a balance of ecosystems. So that if the law of nature is followed, then this nature will be sustainable and this nature will bring mercy to humans. In my opinion, the occurrence of natural disasters is because humans do not enforce the actual law of nature. Law of nature is law of God. So that if the water becomes flood or becomes a source of disaster, it is not because God's destiny, in the sense that God wants flood, but God's destiny works because the law of God is not fulfilled by humans. Because besides nature was created with perfection, it was also created with balance. End of quote. Now, the repetition in this uh, quote by, in my opinion, in my opinion, uh, clearly shows that the informant speaks for himself. Uh, see, he, he does not speak about the uh, New as an organization. Uh, he speaks uh, as an individual person. Now, the core of the problem, according to this informant, is the anthropocentric thinking of man and making nature an object. But nature is subject. Quote, this is the last quote that I will mention. Human, survive, human survival is very dependent on nature. But our understanding of nature is still very anthropocentric in the sense that nature was created for humans. So humans can do anything to nature. I think that nature must be interpreted as a separate being, so that it does not become an object, that becomes a subject. As I said earlier, so the speaker, flood was actually part of the behavior of nature. So it was a subject that has its own system. End of quote. Now, in the quote, here again, you see struggling. Huh? A human survival is dependent on nature. And so you would say uh, humans cannot survive without nature, but nature can survive without humans. The, the informant is struggling between, on the one hand, humans and nature as separate entities that interact. That is what we call the interaction model. Human and nature have their own subjectivity. At the same time, humans are part of nature. That is what we call the inclusion model. So nature as a separate thing, subject, it does something to humans. So two models used simultaneously. I come to a conclusion and a discussion. In this paper, we try to get a deeper insight 
into the ambiguity of the stewardship model by conducting interviews among uh, 20 uh, Natlatu Ulama members and 20 Muhammadiyah members. What we did, we advocated a bottom-up approach in developing an eco-theology in Indonesian Islam. <laughs> Starting from the lived religion in everyday experiences, not from the religion as it, as it is learned or taught in Islamic institutions. From our small sample, we conclude that in practice, our respondents easily move between various images of human nature interaction, images that theoretically are separated. There is not much support for the image of the human being as a master over nature, eh? so for a human being as exploitative of nature, but they freely mix a partner model and eh? human and being are two entities that collaborate, they are partners, they work together, but at the same time, they see the human being as a participant in nature. Uh, humans are not separated from nature, they are part of nature. Uh, so theoretically, we can distinguish the, these models, uh, but people on the ground easily shift from one model to the other model. Now, for eco-theology in Indonesian Islam, there is a lot to discuss. For example, the dilemma between a deep ecology and an eco-modernity approach. Between going back to the past, for example, organic farming, or moving to the future, for example, green technology. Between more or less markets. Okay? Do you go for limits to grow, or do you believe in circular, circular economy? Between small and smart solutions to our environmental crisis, and basically between an optimistic or a pessimistic view of humanity. What our respondents put forward, however, is a need to go beyond these dichotomies between models that can theoretically be distinguished, such as interaction and inclusion, but in practice are not. And they value moderation and balancing, or the middle path. The middle path is a life orientation that promotes harmony between humankind, the rest of nature, and the transcendent. In my view, this also signifies that scholars, scholars of Islam, have to go beyond popular distinctions such as the modernist Islam, assuming that Islam must adjust itself to modern values and is compatible with modernity, and a traditionalist Islam, assuming that Islam is to be built on and must adjust itself to the traditions of the past. In my view, these are stereotypes that simplify the reality on the ground. Let us not forget that medieval Islamic thinkers, such as Ibn Sinna and Ibn Rush, did not make a separation between rationality and revelation. Based on this, we also have to balance a pessimistic mood or an optimistic mood. As we all know, eh, some people in the debate say, well, it is too late, eh? we cannot reverse uh, the climate change. Or on the other hand, uh, the optimist, we say, yes, we can. And in this sense, I come back to the Islamic Declaration uh, in the beginning. Uh, in my view, uh, the quote that I started with is too pessimistic. I leave it at that, and I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, uh, Prof. Franz, for the explanation related to the related to the eco theology well uh, as i conclude that everything which uh, surrounds us uh, may be collectively termed as environment 
and then it is from the environment that we got food uh, to eat, water to drink, and then air to breathe, and all the basic necessities required for day uh, to day living. Okay, and then uh, the environment, therefore, can be said that uh, constitute as life support system. And then in the interaction uh, with uh, fellow humans and close interaction with various aspects of nature through observation and experimentation, accumulation of uh, empirical uh, knowledge uh, created a best uh, for uh, further um, technological development, uh, context and interaction, further their knowledge and uh, all the overall development. So as um, Prof. Franz uh, said before, we go to uh, we go back to the past, or we continue our living um, for uh, what is it? Uh, the development of uh, the environment uh, and uh, human being. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we have a question and answer session. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Professor. Uh, Good afternoon. It is afternoon here, but I don't, I don't know whether. It's a morning here. It's morning in uh, Belanda. Hello. My name is Muhammad Nurzan Sah. I am from uh, UMT. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that you mentioned in your presentation uh, conducted in Indonesia, right? Conducted in Indonesia yes. through your PhD uh, students. <clears throat> well, we got a lot of information about this kind of issue, but I would like to. Uh, I don't want to expand the question, but I would like to ask you because uh, since Indonesian Muslim are majority in Indonesia, uh, they did uh, they da they do the prayer every day, okay. And they focus on, what is it? Uh, we cannot, we, they focus on the prayer five, five, five times in the day and also fasting, uh, pilgrimage to Mecca and, and so on. But uh, the fact that you mentioned just now, it, it is very sad, very, what is it, uh, embarrassing that uh, you mentioned that Chitarum, I'm, I'm not mistaken, that you, you mentioned Chitarum is the, uh, there are a lot of waste, waste there. Okay, uh, would you please share to us how to arouse, I mean, how to arouse the awareness of Indonesian Muslim to participate in ecology theology? Uh, you get my point, Professor? Yes. Thank you so much for your answer. Yes. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think your question is uh, uh, very pointed. And uh, I indeed, um, in a previous research uh, done with um, uh, Ms. Haryani Sapanintias, who is also among us, and uh, she spoke uh, this morning, um, we, we did a, a research in, uh, on, on Shitarum, uh, one of the most polluted rivers in the world. Uh, Haryani uh, can talk a, a lot more about it. And indeed, we asked ourselves how come that on the one hand you have a river which is the most polluted river in the world. And on the other hand, the people who live there are Muslims. And for Muslims, uh, purity is the core value, the core value of their religion. Okay? Religion is built on cleanliness. We, we see that in every Pesantran. So how is that uh, dilemma? How is that possible? Uh, th that was the study that we conducted with uh, Ms. Ariani Sapanintias. Um, so we are not going to repeat that uh, research. But coming to your, your question, uh, it is exactly what I started with. Uh, there is a uh, distinction between, on the one hand, what Islam teaches, yeah, the theology, and on the other hand, the everyday practice. So in our uh, follow-up research, we try to find out how come how come 
that indeed Muslims uh, preach about uh, purity as the core value in their religion. And on the other hand, we see that the everyday practice is different, not, not only in Shitarun. Um, uh, you, you can see it on, in, in streets, you, you can see it almost everywhere, even in Pesantran that I vis visited, uh, some of the Pesantran are quite dirty. Now, uh, your question is about awareness building. Uh, in our understanding, and that is the, the, the research that we are doing now, uh, it has something to do with our uh, self-understanding as human beings in relation to nature uh, and our responsibility towards nature. So uh, that is what we do now. How we try to find out what are the common uh, understandings of humans in relation to nature and, and their um, responsibility towards nature. Uh, so and then you had so that's where we came to the uh, the, the stewardship uh, model and uh, trying to understand deeper how uh, humans relate to nature and uh, the uh, and and then indeed you come to the to the basic dilemma uh, that the the um, the, the lady just spoke about uh, that, yeah, indeed, uh, uh, we, we believe in science and technology. And uh, Sayyid Nasser that I, I started with was rather pessimistic about science and technology. And so he embedded that in, in more spiritual uh, uh, science. Yeah. Uh, or you go back to, to yeah, the past, yeah, to, to, to organic farming, uh, to, in, in a kind of romantic uh, view of nature. So that's the, the, yeah, the, the dilemma that we are um, uh, exploring to. And well, uh, uh, so coming to your question, uh, we really try to, to, to go deeper into uh, how people understand themselves in relation to nature, and as I said in the beginning, um, this is ongoing. Uh, th this is ongoing uh, work. Um, this is certainly not fin uh, final, but when we understand how humans, Muslims, um, interpret themselves in relation to nature, we also hope to get uh, the public support for nature conservation and I think at that stage we are able to to uh, say more about how to yeah, make people aware huh? awareness building but, but the complexity is yeah what most people say theoretically yes uh, we are stewards of nature uh, we, we have to preserve nature but in practice they don't do that and well, uh, uh, I think there is also a, a, a task here for religious leaders. Um, and well, uh, one of the foundings in the research that, that we did with uh, Ms. Haryani Sapaninkias was that there is also a kind of a, 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 a yeah, we call it a, a secularization uh, that um, many religious leaders, definitely not all, but many religious leaders say, well, you know, nature conservation, that is something for the government. We, we deal with spiritual, uh, we, we, spill, we deal with uh, spiritual matters and uh, nature conservation, that is uh, a government uh, issue. So I think uh, definitely for uh, religious leaders and for Islamic universities, by the way, uh, there is a, a task to uh, train religious leaders that are aware of um, yeah, the, the ecological challenges and are willing to respond to that uh, in theory and practice. Well, it, well a, long, a long answer to, to a simple question, but, but uh, yeah, you clearly see that, that I don't have a final answer uh, to that, uh, to, to the, yeah, the, 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 the gap between, on the one hand, what we teach and what we believe, and on the other hand, what we do in our daily lives. 
Oke. Okay. Ya, yeah. um, is it clear, Mr. Nuzan Cheh? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. By the way, uh, just just one addition. Uh, I, I don't want to blame uh, human beings. Uh, I, I blame myself. But in many parts. Uh, by the way, I just came back from Indonesia. That's uh, why my lecture was uh, pre-recorded. I mean, in many villages, simply there is no waste management. People have no place to. to so it is also an infrastructure problem. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, for the answer. Okay. Uh, if I connected to uh, our first materials to now materials, actually, um, uh, it's our task, yeah, or job as a Muslim, yeah, um, to the issues of environmentalism in the uh, is Muslim world, yeah, due to uh, some problems that we faced in Indonesia. Of course, uh, start from the garbage in the river, and then uh, perhaps uh, next. Uh, actually, what policy that probably uh, taken uh, from the government, yeah, related to that issues, and then yeah, hopefully as uh, Pak Suparto uh, mentioned before, uh, University of Muhammadiyah Tangerang hopefully uh, will become a pioneer, yeah, for uh, the renewable renewable uh, energy meters yeah um actually do we still have time to have uh, one more question yeah oh yeah again pak parto yeah okay sorry if i'm too dominant sorry Uh, Mr. Fran, Fran Joseph. Uh, I'm Suwarto from University Muhammadiyah Tangerang. I'm interesting with uh, your paper to discuss about the pro and con between uh, this human nature as a subject or object. Uh, in both sides, actually, uh, this is very interrelated. Uh, but which one do you prefer? Uh, your opinion, which one is more dominant, as a subject or as an object? In the Okay. <laughs> you, you ask my personal uh, opinion. Well, first of all, let me correct. Uh, this, this was not my opinion. I, I quoted uh, a, an interview by a Muhammadiyah member. So uh, the, the distinction between nature as subject and nature as object uh, is not my finding. Uh, it, it was mentioned by an interviewee, a, Mus a, a Muhammadiyah member. Uh, and it is quite it is quite interesting, and I think it, it gives a lot of uh, food for thought by Islamic scholars to to go further on that. Of course, when you make nature an object, uh, you end up in kind of a mastery um, model uh, where, where yeah we can use uh, nature we can. Uh, exploit nature uh, because it is simply material it is object um, when you when you give nature uh, when you see it as a subject as acting uh, you relate to it uh, in a different way um, honestly uh, honestly if you if you ask my, my personal opinion I, I, I don't I, I don't have a preference, and, and I, I'm struggling with it myself as, as a believer, uh, how, how to relate to nature. Um, in, in, okay, if, if you ask my, my personal opinion, um, I, I'm, I'm a believer myself, uh, I, I tend more to the uh, uh, participant model, so uh, rooted in, in a Christian, uh, a more mystic tradition, I would say I, I feel more familiar with uh, the model that I'm not distinct from nature, 
that I'm part of nature. Um, and yeah, then indeed the question is what makes human beings so special um, in relation to nature? Of course, we, we, we damaged uh, nature through our science and technology. That's the, uh, the, the statement by Lynn White. By the way, I think also Syed Nasser uh, 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 thought that. So yeah, we have a certain responsibility uh, to, towards nature. But yeah, we are part of it um, as well. So um, I don't, uh, well, my personal opinion uh, would be, I, I don't follow the speaker who, who saw na uh, humans and nature as two, two separate entities that, that are interrelated. And uh, uh, as a person, I have a body. Um, I, I am partly material body, so part of uh, the, the environment, and at the same time, I relate to it. So yeah, that's the complexity. I, uh, honestly, I, I don't have a final answer to that. So the, the, the struggle that we see in the interview is, is also my struggle. How, how, do you, how do we see ourselves as, on the one hand, uh, part of nature, embedded in nature, on the other hand, also um, yeah, having a special position in the sense that we, we have uh, rationality, we have science and technology, um, and we misuse science and technology to exploit nature. And at, at the same time, we can use science and technology to, to uh, better nature. Okay. Yeah, um, between uh, what is it, nature as a subject or na nature or human, human, yeah, human nature as a subject or object? Yeah, that's uh, the question. And then it's uh, already been answered by Prof. Franz. Is it, uh, what is it, enough? Okay. Um, Okay, uh, I guess, uh, what is it, uh, due to the limita limitation of time uh, to our uh, discussion today uh, related to our materials um, of environmentalism uh, in the Muslim world, so um, it's, uh, what is it, the end of the discussion. Uh, hopefully, uh, today's discussion uh, will uh, give... Um, uh, insightful, yeah, for all the uh, academ academicians of uh, Muhammadiyah or um, all Muslims in the give world. Some, okay, uh, conclusion. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Thank uh, you. Concluding remark from Prof. Eko. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Only one minute. First, so first of all, um, I'm really happy to be here. And before I close my conversation, I think there are a few things first, because environment issue is current issue. Environment issue is real issue. It's not only finished on our discussion. It cannot be finished only in this event. So I really hope first, let's try to implement, let's try to change our daily life to be more sustainable way. This is the first thing. The second one, if you try to change your daily life from maybe you never think about waste, no to think that there is no waste. If you think from non-sustainable way to be more sustainable way, my second statement is you have to think that our activities, our action, it cannot be short term. It should be long term. Even though you do now, you have done now or tomorrow, but the effect will be happen for your long term. It's not for you, but it's for your children. So once again, environmental effect really happens. It's time for you to take responsibility. It's time for you to take a risk that you have to change your life or our children will be in danger. That's all, I think, all of the things. You don't need to be worried about the Ukraine world, about the third world or something like that, or 
COVID-19, but you have to think that we have a very big issue that we call it climate change, that we call it environmental problem that is already here now. Thank you very much. Air sekalam, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, the keyword is action. Okay, uh, thank you for all the participants, and then thank you for the invited speaker, Prof. Eko, and then Prof. Franz. Nasrul menallahu wa tungkorib. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We would like to thank to invited speakers this session, Prof. Eko Priyo Purnomo, PhD, from Universitas Muhammadiyah, Yogyakarta. And also for uh, speaker, invited speaker, Professor Franz Joseph from Redwood University, Netherlands. Please, Mr. Prio, as a invited speaker, to receive our souvenir, and we'll be given our souvenir from, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rector Universitas Muhammadiyah Tangerang, Mr. Dr. Ahmad Amrullah, MPD. Please, in front on the stage. Invited speaker, Mr. Professor Eko Prio, will give a book as a souvenir to Rector Universitas Muhammadiyah Tangerang. And also, Mr. Professor Prio, give book as a souvenir to moderator. And now. Invited speaker representative, take a picture with Rector UMT. Uh, saya ucapkan terima kasih Prof. Eko yang sudah begitu luar biasa menginspirasi ya dalam pelaksanaan uh, di konferensi internasional ini yang akan memotivasi kita. Walaupun memang budaya seminar atau conference di kita belum terlalu melembaga nih Prof. Di kalangan akademik mestinya memang peserta itu harus full dari awal sampai akhir. Ya. Apa ya yang kira-kira kita bisa terus tanamkan ini ya sampai pesertanya tetap uh, stabil. Saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada teman-teman yang memang punya kesadaran tinggi ya dalam menggali ilmu. Saya sampai tadi berpikir nih untuk mendorong ini ya. Eh padahal begitu luar biasa ya pelaksanaan kegiatan ini banyak hal yang bisa kita capai. Pertama, 
ya kita punya pengetahuan ya soal uh, banyak hal ya salah satunya tema yang kita angkat uh, environmentalism ini ya yang kedua kita terlatih dalam uh, berbahasa Inggris ya saya terus terang uh, punya kemampuan bahasa Inggris yang paling buruk lah di sini gitu ya uh, tapi ingin ya betul betul keinginan itu terus uh, membara ya insya Allah saya kira kalau terus ber Lanjutan dipaksa dengan kondisi kayak begini. Bila perlu, kalau bisa mah seminar internasional sebulan dua kali ini kita adain. <tuk> ya. Biar terlatih nih dipaksa. Ya, nanti yang mengadakan bisa KUI, bisa Aika, ya, bisa Pasca, bisa semua prodi. Sebulan dua kali kita adakan. Ya, nanti e, mereka yang ikut empat kali saya ajak keliling dunia. <tuk> Saya tadi uh, ngobrol dengan Prof Eko itu ya. Yang penting kita bagaimana uh, tusi ya melihat negara-negara lain ya di bidang pendidikan kampus dan lain-lain tumit ketemu pro- profesor ya di uh, universitas-universitas lain bahkan nanti tulen. Nah ini saya kira uh, saya pikir ini nggak bisa kita uh, ya apa ya kita tanpa apa ya, dorongan bersama gitu ya. Nah itu. Terus yang lainnya adalah kita mendorong budaya keilmuan ini sampai nanti munculnya jurnal jurnal internasional yang berangkat dari eh, kampus kita. Maka saya ingin nanti nggak eh, berhenti di sini eh, teman-teman tim ya yang membangun eh, jurnal yang mengangkat isu-isu eh, pemahaman Islam ya. Lebih-lebih di tengah-tengah ritualisme yang sekarang merajalela di Indonesia kembali kepada zaman jahiliyah kan begitu. Nah ini kita mau bangkitkan bahwa eh, kekuatan ilmu itu adalah hal yang paling penting dalam mendobrak TBC yang lagi digembar-geburkan ini. Saya kira itu dan and I finally open it. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, and uh, finally, uh, open it this even uh, by saying, Alhamdulillahirobbilalamin. Nasrulmilawatun karib. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <laughs> Thank you for Rector UMP for the speech. For Mr. Nur Zamsyah, please receive our souvenir because you are active as participant in this conference. Please, Director of AICA, to come in front on the stage. Dear audience, at the end of agenda. <laughs> Let's us close our international conference with say hamdalah alhamdulillah alamin that's all from us wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh